when we were really deliberate about open and not just about the license you stick on something, but the how of the open, the leaving the breadcrumbs, the ensuring people understand those pieces, things lived on longer. And that's really that's really the gold standard or should be a gold standard for philanthropy. How can I make my investment actually make a difference beyond the investment? Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women who have made an impact in Africa. We're talking about their personal, educational and career journeys, the choices they have made along the way and what they have gained by setting aside their doubts in a world where women's voices and opinions often go unheard and unacknowledged. Inspiring Open is a space to explore the value of sisterhood and how networks of sharing and openness can create waves of change. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. This week on Inspiring Open, I have Helen Tevy as my guest. She is CEO of Shuttleworth Foundation, a small social investor that provides funding to dynamic leaders who are leading social change. Helen vacationed in South Africa and, like many others, fell in love with the country and its people. This love affair led to her working with Shuttleworth Foundation for over two decades. She has moved the foundation from traditional funding methods towards a fellowship model of co-investment and collaboration with potential leaders of change. With over 20 years of experience working with international NGOs and agencies, Helen has a deep-rooted understanding of where philanthropy goes wrong and how it needs to change. She is a big advocate of openness and administrative justice as integral tools to democratize philanthropy and improve education and economies everywhere in the world. Now on Inspiring Open, Helen Turvey. First of all, in your bio on the internet, you talk about your frustrations with farming. Tell me about that. Your three <laughs> hands. Your, your, your three hands. <laughs> I love that's where we started. So I um I I, I am. I think I'm a frustrated farmer. I think if, if I was born into a different life, I would love to do it. And I think my relationship with food and the ground and dirt and things we grow has evolved over time I you know, I grew up in the 80s things were in plastic containers you know that's what we did it was progress um and and I I'm I'm now I'm now in my mid 40s I'm uh, I'm an aspiring vegan I'm not a very good vegan I'm a, I'm a very good vegetarian I'm not a good vegan um uh and I just think I just look at the plastic and the huge you know, bright white lights of supermarkets. And all I see is that's not sustainable. This is not going to work. This doesn't, this doesn't work for everybody. It's not everyone's reality. And all we're doing is, um, I, we're, all we're doing is, you know, taking things from one place in the earth, passing them through a number of hands and sanitizing them and then dumping rubbish somewhere else. Like this is, this is not good. Um, and on the other side of it, it's, I just, I love, I love, being outside. I love being dirty. I love dirt under the nails. I love nothing tastes as good as a raspberry that you pick off your own bush. Um, it's just, it's perfect. Um, so yes, I have, I have various different, um, animals that have come to me and they come because they're generally reject animals from somewhere else. So I started off with three. We did have 10. We've now got six chickens, um, and they're from, so some were from somebody down the road, some were from a, um, a, an ex-battery farm, and they, they arrive and they're all skinny and they don't look like they've got no feathers and they can't really stand up, but they're so sweet and they're so loving and they want to cuddle you. Aww. And then they give you eggs. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's really lovely. <laughs> and we've got three alpacas that um, also were rejected because they weren't good enough to, you know, have the wonderful fleece that alpacas have um, because they're boys and so they don't breed with them um, mm. because, yeah, again, reject alpacas. Got, a, got um, some dogs, rejected tortoise. You know, we'll, take, we'll take anything. We'll take anything and, uh, and we'll try and grow anything. <laughs> Not oh, very good at it. That's but actually we lovely. 
you know, to take these animals and then particularly the skinny chickens and then you the know, skinny they take <laughs> Then, They're very funny. Yeah, and then take care of them. I think it's such a beautiful thing. And obviously, I don't see you as a frustrated farmer. I think you're doing a beautiful thing. And these animals, you know, taking care of them and making sure they are safe, I think it's such a beautiful thing. So I think you are a kind, open-hearted farmer rather than a frustrated <laughs> one. <laughs> That's very nice to suggest. I couldn't ever kill them. That wouldn't That wouldn't happen. That they wouldn't they happen, just, you yeah. know. Come yeah. and hang out. And then we grow, I grow lots of fruit for them to eat. They come, they basically eat all the berries. That I grow. Oh, that's lovely. That's so lovely. Now, tell me about your background, where you grew up and, you know, the kind of upbringing you had. So, goodness me, all the way back, I possibly feel like I'm a little bit in a therapy session. Um... My um, my parents both grew up in the East End of London. They um, both, n- nobody in their families had been to university. They um, they grew up um, within the sound of the Bow Bells, which is uh, where, when you when you grow up there, you can properly call yourself a Cockney, a proper London Cockney. Um, and um, through various different um, different events, they um, had aspirations and dreams that didn't quite work out but then my father had an opportunity to um, go to work in Hungary which at the time was behind the Iron Curtain in Europe so it's communist state controlled by Russia um, and um, and so in their early 20s when no one else in their families had you know had higher education or traveled that's where they went off to um, and they then came back very, very different people. They, you know, their, their tiny world, I think, had been expanded through travel and they saw different perspectives, different cultures, different understanding. And I think the most important thing that they, um, or certainly that I felt in my upbringing was, um, sure, you have a perspective, but other, one, other people have different ones for different reasons and all of them are valid. And so when myself and my siblings were born, we traveled and went to school in um, in Kuwait. We tra- we we lived in um, in uh, the Mediterranean for a bit. We travel we traveled a lot as children. We were often going on holiday to places like Kenya and other you know experiencing more. That's what they always wanted us to do. They wanted us to see different perspectives and perspectives that weren't you know that sometimes didn't quite gel with their own and that was okay that was that was good um so when I then became you know a fully fledged adult hilariously at the age of 18 and went to university um it was right at the start of when um Europe were um started something called an Erasmus program there is still the Erasmus program wonderfully in Europe today and it's you 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 get on it and and do um, various bits of travel and study in different universities but at that time they'd started it and um hadn't quite worked out all the kinks so essentially for four years I got to you know travel around Europe and South America, I was in Argentina and various other places, um, with a bunch of people who were also from different cultures and different continents, um, and experienced the world. It was it was quite phenomenal. Would you say your background has played any role in shaping you towards your career? Oh, definitely. I think the... Um, I'm, a, I'm an incredibly confident person, I think that... And you get that just by, you know, either walking into a bar somewhere and not knowing anyone and that be but also from from being able to understand that there isn't yeah that there isn't there isn't one view and therefore your view is just as valid as anybody else's um and um and I think that the the piece that in my career that has been really useful is that you know I I have a fully formed theory of change right now obviously I didn't back then but I think that within philanthropy and the world that I work in, we've you know, philanthropy has existed for for you know, many many years, and we continue to do the same thing. What we say is there are these people who are incredibly privileged and have so much money, and so what they do is they try to make the world a little bit better, and that money hasn't solved it. Right? We haven't solved the world's problems. We still have poverty. We still have disease. We still have 
huge inequities. We still have distrust and all of the isms that you want to, you know, whether it's you, we have all of them. It's, it hasn't solved it. And so the thing that I see is that we need those different perspectives to be able to solve the problems. And when you keep pulling on that thread, you understand that actually the real problem lies in that money equals power to make a difference. And the problem is, is that's not making a difference. So what we need to do is decentralize that power and decision making for other perspectives to start making a difference. And sure, it might not work. But what I know right now is that it doesn't work. So maybe trying something different would be beneficial. Did you always know that you were going to be in the philanthropy space? Was that originally your career path? No, it wasn't obvious to me at all. I was very keen to um, you know, move to, I, I wanted to be in London because it was the center of everything. I wanted to be able to travel. I wanted independence. I wanted... Um, you know, all of those, all of those things that I think that you probably should want when you're, you know, in your 20s. Um, and I worked in, um, hilariously, in various different media agencies. So for a time, I wore all black and thought I was very cool. Um, and um, <laughs> I really wasn't. <laughs> and then um, it was, you know, the start of the internet. There was, uh, we, we we were doing things like I'm um, putting, um, putting, um, annual reports online and so literally people typing out the annual report and making a web page which sounds wild today because you know obviously it's it's uh, it's it's there first um and so we were you know, experimenting with the internet and doing bits and pieces and then the agency I worked for also did some um pro bono um things and I worked on a couple of accounts and um one of the them was for the RNLI and one of them was for um, the um, what is now called Dogs Trust um, and I just loved it I loved I, I remember sitting in the meeting I was I mean I was a kid I was you know, really early 20s sitting in a meeting and instead of people saying oh yes I want to sell more soap they were actually talking about differences they were making and things they were doing that was you know that was good and right and just and and I remember like, people were talking about actually fundraising to save lives of people who were distressed at sea or animals who were broken. That you know, or actually, it was mind blowing to me, absolutely. And I hadn't ever considered it at all before. Um, and so um, something happened, which was amazing. Was my department um, became sort of was made um, obsolete and was moving to a different agency. So I lost my job. And it was, I remember my mom saying to me, I knew she was made redundant once and it was the best thing that ever happened to her. And she's absolutely right. Totally made redundant. It was a little bit sad, but also I'd got, you know, I'd got some cash in my pocket when you made redundant. It was all right. I had a little, you know, so I had a bit of time and, uh, and I then took a, you know, any, any jobs that could come at me that would allow me to sit in front of, you know, a computer screen that would give me time. So I became a receptionist in a, um, in a, an estate agent and, uh, and and it was thoroughly enjoyable for about three days, you know, answering the phone and doing that. Got a bit bored after that. But, then, but what it enabled me to do was I sorted out my CV. I decided actually what I wanted to do. I researched what I wanted to do. And I knew I wanted to be in this place of actually making a change. And all of a sudden, the design of the world was different for me. I wasn't optimizing for but well, I get I was about to say I was not optimizing for me. I, I was absolutely optimizing for me, but optimizing for me in a way that I could play a role that would make me feel that I was creating some sort of difference, that I was changing something, that I was doing something. Um, and I know I've spoken to so many people who have that, you know, they were an activist at university or they did these incredible things. I was not that person. My eyes were only opened in this moment when I when I heard other people speaking. And um, yeah, and I felt. I could do something. I think that's the other piece is you, you asked earlier about my upbringing. I genuinely felt I could do something, even if I had no idea what it was. Um, I could do something. And I, what I knew, and um, again, it's so interesting that you asked about my life before because I hadn't really put these things together, but I had this wonderful maths teacher and he said to me, you know, pay attention to what you enjoy because if you enjoy something, you can you will do it brilliantly. 
And so I knew I enjoyed technology because I've been tinkering with the internet in this um, in, in this agency. And I knew I wanted to do something that was different and philanthropic and making a change. And so I did two things. I um, was doing some um, voluntary bits for Book Aid International, which was essentially libraries that drive around in trucks in Africa. Um, and then working for, um, and then I got a, a real job for um, guide dogs for the blind. And I loved it. I loved everything about it. I sort of learned the ropes of, okay, this is what people do. This is how you do everything from write proposals to understand how to write narratives about change making, how to, and it, I mean, obviously it was great that there were cute puppies around, but it wasn't actually, it, I knew it wasn't the subject that was the thing that got me. I was, I was in a really established really well run really well known organization that taught me a whole bunch of stuff and it enabled me to think about that you know the strategic advantages of of how to work in those places then i um i i went to south africa for a holiday and it just again fell in love fell in love with the country fell in love with the continent also immediately understood some of the problems with the things that had been happening with Book Aid International and other, which was very much about a Western perspective, parachuting in particular ideals and solutions in a place that doesn't belong to you, that isn't, for, you know, all of, all of those bits and pieces. It was also at that time that I knew um, the founder of the Shuttleworth Foundation and had the opportunity to go to the foundation. And then the question was posed to me, you know, what would you do to make this better? How would this actually compete? How would this make more of a difference than the difference it's making right now? Which kept bringing me back to that Book Aid International. Sure, we have this van that's driving around doing this great stuff. But if the money stops and if the van stops, what is the actual impact that you've made? What is the value you have left? What is the, what is the change you are making? And is the change only being made because you're there? And if the answer is yes, that's very nice, but it's not good enough. And that has been the thing that has driven me at the foundation and driven the work that we do at the foundation. Yeah, that's that's the piece that that's the piece that continues to to keep me excited. Well, you had to live and work in <laughs> South Africa. How was it? You know, it's different from just traveling to go and see the country and oh. coming back to yours. But when you have to live and work at a completely different place, completely different continent, it must be different. It's so different. I think I'm I'm a white European, right? The thing that I it constantly hammered home to me was my privilege, and I could I I still can't really get past it. I I can I could see it in everything, everywhere, every every interaction I had, every you know, and you know the accent doesn't help, right? Like I know I sound like a prince. Um, and I think that is the piece that is something that, you know, it, that's really personal. I've come to terms with the fact that, you know, I I walk into a room, I can say something, it's received differently to someone else walking into a room in a different way. And that is that's dreadful. <laughs> it's also reality. The other piece that living in South Africa and understanding it a little bit more was, um, I was actually talking to a friend about this the other day, it's how, um, in fact, Johannesburg, just compared to Cape Town, for example, Joburg makes you quite hard. Like it make like the design of the 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 design of the city, the interactions you have in the city, the um, definition of success in that city, that you the pace of the city makes you go into everything with a fight. Um, and I think that's different in different in different places. There is you know, in for example. Um, you know, in more rural South Africa, I, I lived for a while in Pumalanga, and there's a different different version of that. You go in with a fight, you're not getting anywhere, right? You you have to go with a, hey, there's a process. Who do we talk to? How do we make these things? You know? And so I think that there's some interesting bits about specifically the design of, of, the, of the cities in South Africa that makes you react and behave in a different way, which is not just culture, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a performative piece to this to the structures and architectures that make up that culture and that was quite interesting to me 
I love the country. I'm married to a South African. I think it's a wonderful place. Let's go back to Shuttleworth. How different is it now from when you joined? So when I started, we were South African specific foundation doing traditional grants. So we had a couple of different programs. We had one in education, one in open source technology and you know, other bits and pieces. And essentially people would apply to us and say they want to do this particular program. And then we would give them grant money and then they were, the program would roll out over I don't know anything from six months to two years. We would do a report. We would all say thank you. It would be it would be super. The thing that we started to notice was, and and this is not specific to South Africa. This is this is grant making around the world. And I come a little bit back to you know the, again the Book Aid International. The, absolutely, it makes a difference, and absolutely, it is good. But it doesn't do anything systemically. It doesn't change anything. In a deep sense, it doesn't change the way people behave, Mm. really. What it does is allow people the opportunity to do that thing whilst you're doing that thing. Um, So that was that was the first problem we found or, or the first challenge we started to think about intellectually. The second piece was in philanthropy, there is a there is an idea that I think there's a there's a really odd idea about who the customer is. You know, in any business, the customer is the person that you're that you're interacting with, the person the other side of the company. In philanthropy, there's this really weird idea that the person that you're giving the money to should do things for you and report for you and bend to your will. And actually, your that's your job. Like your whole role is to give the cash out to 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 give it to them. And so so there's an odd power dynamic, which again happens with money and, and the and the customer becomes the board. So looking good to the board and the outside world is the thing that's important in philanthropy. It shouldn't be, but that's how it, that's how it works. And then the actual customer, the person who you're trying to help, has to jump through a bunch of hoops. And so we we've really kept pulling at that power dynamic and it ha- it's not easy and it's certainly not fixed. But I think awareness is a really good first step. And so we try to work out what would happen if we just found these people who were doing amazing things and trusted them and tried to work out what they needed, not what we needed to prove that we're doing the right thing. Because, again, in philanthropy, absolutely some money will be wasted. It will be. But it's not a government service. Government services can't afford to waste money. They are they are bureaucracies for a reason and they need to roll out you know, water, education, health, other bits of people. This is not. This is an opportunity to do something different. And if we're just doing the same things time and time again, then we're never going to be able to actually fix anything. And so we've tried really. So, yes, that, the, that piece of the power dynamic has been really important. The third thing we found was... Um, When you fund an institution, um, generally that money gets sucked up by an institution and institutions always feed themselves first. Whereas when you fund a person, sure, they might be at an institution, but if a person has a driving need to do something, that person will do it no matter what. Um, And so we we were assessing all of our programs and we we could see the big difference between that. And then the last thing we found was that when we did things openly, when we were really deliberate about open and not just about the license you stick on something, but the how of the open, the leaving the breadcrumbs, the ensuring people understand those pieces, um, things lived on longer. And that's really that's really the gold standard or should be a gold standard in philanthropy. How can I make my investment actually make a difference beyond the investment? And so with that, we started to build a different a different foundation. Um, and we decided we would fund individuals, so we fund fellows. And not it's not a um, it's not a you know a genius award. It's not something for something you've done. It's something that you are hopefully going to do, and you're trying to do, and you're trying to work out how to do. Um, so unproven individuals who are who are being very thoughtful about open can really clearly articulate what they want to change, and also see their role within it because. Often people think that they can either do all of it or none of it. You know, you know, change the world, we're not going to fund you. I can change the world, we're not going to fund you. But if you can see the problem statement and see how you can do it and how you can get, gather community to do that, that's that's the sweet spot of us being able to, to fund and work with you. We um, 
try to understand what it is they need. The, the deal is, is once they've applied and once they're in, they're in. There's not judgment, there's help. There's understanding, there's progress, there's, there's really there's trying, trying to see what those threads are and those pieces are that aren't working and why. And if they're not experimenting and if they're not failing sometimes, then then that's, you know, this is not a good investment for us. We should be, because that's the only way we can learn. What do you look out for in these leaders? There are a few things that, you know, that we're quite clear about. So as I said, someone who can articulate the idea, someone who we believe can do the thing they want to do, someone who is genuinely committed to open and not just, I've put a license on it. You know, you can hear it. You can hear when people talk about their motivations for how and why they do things. Um, but actually, what we're really looking for is that little bit of pixie dust, you know, the magic that makes people be the people who are going to keep going. We know when we talk to people, and we've got better when we talk to people um, about really teasing out, is this something that they're getting a grant for? Or is this something that they are genuinely committed to for life? And that goes back to the people versus projects piece. Um, projects come and go and environmental factors make a huge difference as to whether a project is relevant or not anymore. Um, but somebody fighting an inequity or an injustice in a particular field, that doesn't change, right? It just, the goalposts change constantly. And so if we can set that person up for success and, and set that person up to be resilient and set that person up to keep going, um, that's what we're looking for. Because to be clear, there's, I don't, I don't see in the next 20 years, you know, gross capitalism changed for something else. I don't see poverty being wiped out. These people need to stay in the game. We need these people in the game to, to help preserve our planet, preserve, preserve our people, preserve, you know, a, a better vision of what we can, you know, how we can live. You don't put too much limitation on applicants because you want to be blown away by ideas during the application process. What are some of the ideas that have blown you away? Oh, goodness. I mean, every single round we do, when we actually look at the applications and talk to the people, they put forward these brilliant ideas of that we could never think of, um, that we, would, we don't have an understanding of the problem set. We're so far removed from the problem set. And, uh, and I think, again, thinking back to that sort of bigger vision of philanthropy, if you sit in a boardroom and you've got all this money and you're deciding about what the problem set is, you can't possibly have any realistic you know, understanding of that. And even if you've gone to all of these places and you're not living them, you don't really feel it and see it. You don't understand that this, this you know, you don't understand it in the same way. And so therefore your solution set will be different to somebody's lived experience. Um, and so the reason we don't pare it down is we don't want to define it for other people. We um, also found that when we did, because we did right at the beginning say, you know, here are our themes that we're interested in. We found that we missed a whole bunch of stuff that was interesting that, you know, that wasn't already out there. And I think going back to that idea of we're not solving the problems now in philanthropy with the money we have, we're doing some good stuff, but we're not solving it. So we can't possibly anticipate what's what's coming forward. And again, the, the flip side of that is that there are some things that I thought we would never fund again. So we funded a lot of work um, to do with open access within academic and scholarly publishing many, many years ago. And I thought we wouldn't do that again. You know, we, were, we were essentially aiming to sort of you know, open up the scientific literature for everyone on the continent of Africa or everyone you know, in places that weren't the white Western ivory towers of, um, of academe. And we did lots of work in that. I didn't think we would do it again. But then someone came with an idea that changed the frame yet again. And so it's not just new things that blow us out of the water. It's a different frame on something that we've done in the past. So if we kept to those rigid structures, we wouldn't do that. So four, I think four or five years ago, we started working with someone called um, Achal Prabhala and specifically in access to medicines. Um, and how timely is that given the global pandemic, <laughs> the, the um, you know, vaccine apartheid and the inequities that have been that have happened um, with, with vaccine um, distribution and rollout. And so it wasn't something that was on the radar. Like today it would be obvious to fund 
an access to medicines piece. Then it wasn't necessarily, but we thought he was brilliant and we could see this, we could see the problem set. It's not working in the way it should be working. And then it just so happened that, you know, his work became suddenly incredibly relevant um, today. We've worked in things like um, debt and and debt relief. Um, Again, totally changed my frame on what debt is. You know, if you get yourself into debt, surely just like me, you should pay it off. You should, you know, that's an old trope that's quite hard to argue against. But when you start working it and you see how predatory debt works and how it just, I mean, it's just a world of capitalist evil. Um, and how if you can just shine open into it and ch- again, change that frame as to who owns what and, and change, I think, that narrative on who's the good guy and what are they, you know, all of those pieces it starts to make it a little bit different. And I think that today we have different conversations about debt and predatory debt than we did five or six years ago. Same with access to medicine, same. With, and so I think that's the thing that I'm really looking for. Those conversations that aren't yet happening, that I hope in five years time will happen, that draw us closer to a more equitable society. I, I love that. I absolutely love this. And when it comes to open, obviously the work you do is rooted in openness personally at what point did you like experience open in the sense of open movement and even the the, your work you do and how rooted it is in open so that is such an interesting question because it is so multifaceted I have a very specific memory of um experiencing open source software which is so different to actually open and open movements and open philosophies. And open. and I think that I, I definitely conflated the two. Um, my, my hilarious memory about um, experiencing open source software was just, I, I ran Ubuntu on my laptop. It took forever. It wasn't very good in the beginning. And I famously within that software community said, um, oh my God, not this open source shit again. And I was so cross about it just because I wanted to be productive. Um, this is many years ago, I might like. That. <laughs> um, but what is interesting for me is the how if I stand back and I look at the world of open source software and the world of open hardware and the world, you know, anything that's got you know, open access, open, anything that's got like a real label on it, it happened at a very particular time. And we can really track that back and say, you know, we can see the source documents. This is when this was used. This is when this was defined. This is how this was defined. And it was really defined by a group of, I mean, let's be clear, white, privileged, very intelligent men who were doing something to get something out of it um and it was a absolutely it was a pushback against systems that weren't working and proprietary systems and i'm not saying that there wasn't good in it there was lots of good in it but that's where it arose from and if we actually take a huge step back and think about openness as a philosophy which is where the foundation comes in you if we take the and in fact we did used to refer to it as if we take the roots of open source software and apply them to other places in fact now we think about it no if we take the roots of open, which are about sharing, learning communities, if we take those roots, what? how can we be more deliberate and better about it and, and rally against this artificial desire to close control and um, productize something for, for capitalist gain? And then I, I think back to, you know, recipes and stories and patterns and seed banks and you know, all of the things that are actually far more feminist in terms of not necessarily their ownership, but in terms in terms of the cultural process of how those stories and ideas are handed, built upon um, and learnt from. And I think that is the beautiful thing about open and what and you know, fashion, those sorts of those sorts of industries. And I think reclaiming open in a different way than has been defined by those few people at a particular time is really important to me because I think we were, and again, we got a lot out of it, but I think we were very blinkered in what that could and should be, and and more importantly, who it was for. Um, and it wasn't for me. It wasn't. It wasn't for you. Um, it wasn't for people who you who uh, who wanted to just play and tinker and get it wrong and say. 
we need to stretch this the the that definition and we need to use it ourselves in ways that we care about because that's actually what open is right it's the it's the iteration and build upon um, and working out how it applies to you as an individual you in your work and how you want to invite people into that it's beautiful it's the most beautiful thing in the world it is um and it's yeah i think there's so much possibility if if we can if we can be if we can stretch it if we can stretch it and and do the genuine inviting on a personal level what does open mean to you goodness me we're getting a bit emotional here it's about value creation it's about understanding that you we aren't siloed individuals that we live within communities and communities impact each other um if we genuinely behaved in open ways we wouldn't have the you know climate disaster that we have on our hands because we would understand you know our impacts impact other people we would we would care for each other much more we would have we would I, I think it's that interconnected piece um which is making me making me sort of go back to the ideals of you know, socialism which you which are absolutely rooted within art for me personally within within openness and that that connected piece and and then my question goes to how do we actually design to incentivize care and collaboration versus control and personal gain and those two pieces are they butt up against each other quite a lot but I think we can I think we can design to incentivize for those things um I had a very hilarious moment last week where my car broke <clears throat> and um uh need a car where I live I had to get a higher car the higher car was brand new about performance it and it, it what was so interesting is it incentivized me to drive fast to consume petrol to like you know, all of the things that it was it was it was quite exciting and exhilarating to do it and then because obviously i have a dead car i had to buy a new car and i bought a second hand tiny small nissan leaf that's an electric car the same person so me it dropped off this performance car that was quite exciting to drive three minutes later I step into this very small electric second-hand car the incentives for me to drive differently were overwhelming I'm now optimizing for you know care of my battery I don't want to I you know the the harms to the environment I'm driving like a you know an 87 year old and I'm not quite there yet um and I could I was startled with how when you design incentives differently, people behave differently. The same people behave differently. And I think that's the key that we have not yet cracked with open. And we, if we can design incentives for people to think broader than their own gain, then they become different beasts. And we could all live in this wonderful, harmonious utopia. I love this perspective. You know, I've never actually thought about it in this way. So, Helen, you've been at Shuttleworth for maybe over 10 years oh yeah 15 16 Ooh, years now I know <laughs> okay for somebody to work in the same organization for over 15 years I think two things happen either that passion you started you know work there with is still burning and the work environment you are in supports this passion and drive that you still have or you are probably stuck and just don't <laughs> <laughs> Which just is can't it? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> just can't see yourself doing anything else or, or you know, like discovering something new. And which of these so, two is happening for you? I discover something new every day. I mean, I'm probably very irritating to work for because I'm excited about pretty much everything. Um, whether it's thinking about, you know, the Australian Open and the visa issues in Australia all the way through to, you know, everything is interesting because everything is interesting and everything makes up how we behave in this world and why we do what we do. Um, I have the privilege of working with people who think they can make a difference. And that's wild because people are making a difference. And these people are continue to be excited, continue to be driven, continue to shape my perspective on the world. I'm definitely not the same person I was when I started. If anything, I think I'm more excited about the potential that we have as humans to, to impact the planet properly. And I think that the other piece is, is that the work 
hasn't in any way stayed the same. We have myself and um, another director, we're on a bunch of boards from fellows organisations that have you know, left the programme. and work. So there's more work still to be done. This work doesn't end. And I think that's the piece that's interesting. Again, when you focus on the people, not the projects, interestingly, the projects keep going because the people keep going. They may look wildly different, but the the things that fuel them are still are still there. Um, and we thoroughly enjoy it. We, th- we enjoy the people. I enjoy the people I talk to. And so I think that's it. I'm constantly challenged, constantly seeing possibility, constantly invited in to, to do something positive. And that's that's huge, right? That's a, such a privilege um, that you you please come and help and you have a piece of a puzzle that is going to impact something um, in a positive manner. That's, I mean, that's addictive. I think one of the other pieces going, it's I just, I keep reflecting on the questions you asked at the beginning is the, um, you know, about upbringing and shaping and thinking. I love making decisions. And what I think a lot of the time is that when we're in organizations and places that know what they're doing, decision making becomes pretty hard because it's all obvious because we've done it a million times. So when something comes up that's different, it becomes quite difficult. Every day we have different. And so we have to make decisions on things. And sometimes they're wrong. And that's okay because then we can learn and we can make the different decision next time. And so I think that sort of the ability to to make decisions and learn from them and not let those cripple you, even if you might need to take five minutes and then carry on going is um, is really important. And that's that's the environment that I have that I can work in, which is which is amazing. What does it mean to be a CEO? I know, obviously, decision making uh, is part of it, but <laughs> but what does this what does it mean as a woman? And I ask because we don't have a lot of women CEOs in the world. Mm-hmm. We don't. And I feel that when men fail, they don't get the backlash compared to when a woman fails. I guess, I mean, I think we're, we're so used to men failing and then we want a woman <laughs> and then and then we put all this responsibility on a woman. And, and, you know, sometimes we forget that a woman can also, a woman is just like a man. A woman can also fail. Of course, we don't hope for her to fail, but it can happen. And mm-hmm. she should not be judged differently because that happened. And I feel that probably adds some layer of pressure on a woman CEO, you know, this pressure to excel, this pressure to kind of do well so you pave the way for other women to follow, this pressure, like you carry generations of women at your back. So you have this huge pressure to do well. Do you have that pressure as a CEO? I think on the one hand, as a CEO, it's just a title, right? And you're just working with your team. And if your team is brilliant, then you can be brilliant because you can all support each other and you can all work, you know, so that that is that is the one side of it. However, being really realistic, I think there's a massive difference today than there was even five years ago, definitely 10 years ago. I um I remember once I uh I was in in a meeting with um various people in, in the broader group, and I just halfway through I just stood up and walked out and I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. In this moment, I'm absolutely done. And it's because you'll have experienced this. I, I I said something, it was ignored. It was repeated by a man five minutes later. Oh, that's a great idea. You know, just please. Um, you know, all of the pieces. And then um, the other thing I saw and I still see today is there's not there's not enough color in the room. There's not you. Know, I, I think five years ago, there weren't enough women in the room. I think yeah. today there's not enough color in the room. Mm, and mm. I genuinely believe that, um, again, this broader philosophy of we haven't fixed it with just money and the ideas we have. So if we need different perspectives, we need to have that diversity in the room and we need to decentralize this power. Um, and so I think that I'm in a really fortunate time where the door has been opened for women to do things hasn't been great. And most of, you know, again, yeah, most of the time, 10 years ago, I was the only woman in the room. Now I'm not. And that's brilliant. Um, My kids are definitely not going to be the only person in the room. And it's definitely not going to be all white, which is brilliant. Um, So I think I'm at a fortunate time when, you know, when we can see 
those sides where we we remember what that past is, but it also gives us fever to uh, and fight to change it for the future. Not necessarily as a female CEO, but as a female leader, I think that there have been times, especially when I was younger, when I was so frustrated, I didn't understand how to let out some of the things. And so I would behave as potentially the males in the room. I don't know. I, none of it was none of it was um, particularly deliberate. Um, however, what I feel a greater confidence around now is is you know, as a woman, absolutely, it is it is you know, easier um, physiologically for me to cry and for me to do. And if I want to, I will. And that doesn't mean that I'm not right. And it doesn't mean that I don't have power. It means that I'm a whole human. And I'm very comfortable with that. Um, and again, going back to privilege, like that's that's something that comes with age. Um, it's something that comes with my you know, extensive CV. I've been in enough rooms now and made enough impact for it to be okay. Um, however, I do have a personal, a personal thing that I do, which is whenever I'm sitting in a room and there are women in the room, if you notice how many times in um, mixed gender groups, um, women will say, oh, sorry, I'm prattling on or, oh, um, oh, you probably know more about this. Or there's that techie bit that I'm not quite clear on. I will take them aside, say, you were paid to be here. You add value. You know what you're talking about. Just remove those sentences from the, those qualifiers from the beginning of your sentences, because I used to do it. I used to do it all the time. And it's not true. We are brilliant. Just you, people want you in the room. You're invited into the room, so take up the space. And I think that idea of taking up space is really important because no one knows what they're talking about. Everyone's finding their own way. Everyone's trying to learn and understand. If you're doing anything interesting, nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> so, so try. I don't think. I mean, it's very easy to say have the confidence to be that. Don't even have pretend. Just pretend you have the confidence to do it. Remove those qualifiers from your language and, and own that space. Because I guarantee you, the only thing people will remember is you prattled on about technology or you, as opposed to the really valuable, important thing you said in the second half of the sentence. So just say that second half of the sentence. It's very hard to still see it today. I think women should know that when you are in there, you've earned it and forget about whatever it is and then do the work. At the end of the day, the work will do tell. the work. Do the work. Do the work. Right. That it's so simple. Literally, one foot in front of the, the other. Do the work. Yeah. Yeah. So, have you found support from other women, and how much value do you place on that? I love. I love being around women. I think they are absolutely the lifeblood of communities. I have some incredible support from lots of different women in the space when they've worked specifically in technology or they've worked in philanthropy or they've been um, some of the fellows. And I think that is the piece that I am very conscious of and try not to, um, I try really hard to make sure it isn't, it isn't the defining piece of the relationship is I am sitting on one side that, that hands out money and that with that comes a lot of rank and actually, if you can redefine relationships based on value and learning, then, you know, I, I'm learning and gaining at least as much, if not more, than, than the other person is from just having cash. Um, so that is the piece that I really try to define our relationships on. Also, to just think about women in this space. When I took over the foundation, when we first did it, um, only men applied. Only men applied to be fellows. Um, and they were doing brilliant things. Absolutely brilliant things. Um, but in our first retreat, as we looked around the room and there was, and we were like, oh, this is a little awkward. I'm a woman. <laughs> My other directors are women. Like, what, how is it that we've only appealed to this demographic? Um, and then, and we, we genuinely couldn't work it out. Um, so again, you know, these things aren't obvious. They take time to unpick. They take time to understand. We're very different, um, different shape of the organization now in terms of who applies and how people apply we have um people of color we have trans people we have you know, all sorts of different different um jurisdictions around the world and we've been really deliberate about shaping that and so it's things like that and the incredible women who have applied to the program and been on it that have helped shape us so we can be a better place for more people in this program you've said 
so many things about your work that excite you. So I'm just going to turn this question around because I was going to ask, which part of your work do you find most rewarding? I think <laughs> the, the whole conversation, you know, sounds like you find your work so rewarding. But what part do you find most complicated about what you do? So the part that I find most complicated is we're, we're essentially trying to fight inequity wherever it, wherever it stands. And yet the structures and the systems that we use to do that make it impossible to actually do the business of the business, which is move money around. If I want to fund someone in India, no, nah, forget it. The you know, way the Indian government is set up and the way the, the um, structures are set up in Europe and Africa, it's not going to happen. We just cannot get money to, to the place. I think the structures that we use today are Victorian antiquated structures that, you know, the sort of companies or trusts or any of the, And what they do is they have a philosophy that says that um, due diligence and um, protocol and um, essentially incredibly wealthy people at the top of the pile are best placed to A, make decisions and B, control wealth. Um, and... I don't think that's true and I don't and and it's also very difficult to do something different in fact it's pretty impossible to do something different um and what ends up happening actually if you if you take it all the way to the other end is you know we've all seen um the Panama papers and and you know, essentially Amazon who doesn't pay tax you know so people right at the top of the pile get away with it. The people in it, the masses in the middle try really hard to comply because they're doing the, the good stuff anyway, but they're just jumping through hoops for jumping through hoops sakes. It's not actually um, creating any value. And people at the bottom are left out entirely from these structures. Um, so that's not working. That's not working. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what success metric you could make that look good under. Um, and so that I find incredibly frustrating. Helen, I'm sure at some point in your life, obviously, you found love, you have a <laughs> husband, you have kids. And I always bring the love question up because, you know, sometimes we feel it's not part of humans. It is. And mm -hmm. I think it's such a it's such a big part of, of us as, as a people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of a hilarious story. Um, I'd been working in South Africa for for a while. I loved the place. Um, and so I um, brought my family, my parents, my brother to South Africa uh, just, to, just to experience it, this you know, wild place that I was living, to share the culture, to share just the beauty of the, the country. And um, so we went on a safari and uh, and he was the game ranger. And it's slightly embarrassing, but I did sort of fancy him a little. Um, we stayed in touch. There was, you know, but quite difficult. You know, I was back and forth, other side of the country. Um, I say we stayed in touch. I met him on his 30th birthday. Didn't know it was his 30th birthday. Um, and we were, we were married in the year, um, which was awfully fast for lots of people. And the reason why we got married so quickly was just because it was just for all the practical reasons it was not it was definitely you know living in different countries visas you know, all of the all of the stuff terribly impractical um but the we just both knew and it sounds terribly trite to say it but it wasn't about wings and it wasn't about hell it was just solid and it was just about the same values and about the same ideals and what we wanted and we had so many questions about you know the adventures that we would go on but actually we knew we wanted to do it together. And um, the great thing about, we both knew we wanted kids. Um, I worked again pretty quickly after kids. And in fact, after my third grade, I sort of worked throughout. But at the same time, there's, it, it, it's shared. It's not, it's not one or the other. I sometimes work in the evenings. We work internationally. It's all, you know, it's all over the place. But we also have quite an important time where you know, between five and seven, we're with our kids, we all have supper together, we do, you know, we do all of the, all of the things that we care about together. So it's not about the wings and the hell. It's more, it's more about the companionship and the, the learning. 
Thank you so much, Helen. Um, Thank you. Yeah. This was actually way more fun than I thought it would be. I was really intimidated by the questions. It's all about me. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you had fun. Helen Tevy, CEO of Shuttleworth Foundation, and she and her team are making it possible for young people to change the world with their ideas. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open.